Thanks, Matt, and, and, and really thanks to you for so much. Uh, I think Matt and I started discussing this idea of having this thing in a very casual way maybe about three weeks ago, and Matt managed to pull together this amazing schedule, so I'm really uh, honored to be here. So this book was not intended to be about blockchain. It, it really, uh, I think it mentions blockchain once or something like that, but um, there's a lot of people who got into this space, and honestly, the people that I like the most in this space, who got into it not because of their obsession with a particular technology, but rather with the goal of trying to create sort of a sustainably decentralized future without too much concentration of power, but using market mechanisms. And um, I think that the technology has evolved, but exactly what such a world would look like is pretty vague. And this book is sort of an attempt to describe that. And I think the fact that that matches with the values of so many people in this community has ended up meaning that a lot of people within the community have gotten interest in the ideas. So rather than try to go into the ideas in detail, I'm sure they'll come out through the conversation with Jaron and other people in the afternoon, I just want to portray to you a bit of sort of the vision of this world that we're imagining. And for that, I would ask you for the moment to suspend some of your practical considerations and come with me on a journey of imagination to a fictive city I'm going to call Marketopia. So in Marketopia, um, unlike in Zootopia, the key defining feature is not the diverse mammals uh, that live there, but instead the fact that all the major private property, the buildings and land, the airplanes and trucks and factories and so forth, are continually up for auction to the highest bidder who's allowed to possess those assets as long as she satisfies two criteria. First, she pays that bid that she made um, as a monthly rental payment to a common pool. And second, that she stands ready to surrender that asset to anyone who outbids her for control of it. And while this principle is not applied, let's say, to pets or family heirlooms, it is applied to things we would usually think of as collective decisions, like who will govern Marketopia? Will it exit the market union? Uh, where will its parks be located, and so forth. Except there, rather than being awarded to the single highest bidder, there's a bunch of different options that we'll have. We'll add up people's uh, values on different options. People will bid for each of these options. And then the thing with the highest total bid will be chosen. And the funds that are raised in this way are continually returned in an egalitarian manner to the citizens of Marketopia. You can imagine this being done as some sort of a universal basic income or social dividend, or as in Norway, uh, as a funding source for public goods that are made available to a wide range of citizens. Now, your first reaction to Marketopia is probably that this is the most extreme form of a free market you can possibly imagine, that in fact, it makes, uh, you know, it's something that even Adam Smith couldn't have come up with in a fever dream, because um, while we think of our society as being a free market society, in fact, most things don't have a price. This building, if I had a better use for it, if we decided to turn it into like a crypto accelerator space or something like that, you couldn't just go and buy it at some competitive market price. You'd have to enter into some long and drawn out process of negotiation with the current you know, company or wealthy individual who owns it. Um, and probably they would realize that you had something really creative to do with it, want to really charge you some huge amount for that. Things would all get gummed up in the process, might well break apart, or if it didn't, you'd get charged some huge amount after a long bargaining process. In Marketopia, everything is continually up for auction. Everything has this continual market price. At the same time, um, you might not think that that's such a desirable thing, right? Because in a world where everything's continually up for bid, won't the wealthy be able to outbid everyone for everything, dominate everyone else, assemble all the assets, and oppress the rest of society? But then you have to ask yourself, what do you mean by the wealthy? What does it mean to have wealth? Wealthy is the adjective form of wealth, right? And wealth is things like land, and businesses, and uh, planes, and so forth. And in Marketopia, nobody owns any of those things. All of those things uh, are up for competitive bidding. All their benefits are equally shared among everyone. And all the revenue 
that is raised. Uh, and everyone has an equal right to contest for control of those assets. In that sense, Marketopia is a far more thoroughgoing implementation of the ideas of common ownership uh, advocated by this 200-year-old guy here than is any communist system that ever actually existed, which inevitably degenerated into the control of a bureaucratic elite that was far stronger than the uh, control that they attacked of their capitalist oppressors. Whereas in Marketopia, by the very rules of the system, everyone gets an equal share of the value of assets, and uh, everyone has an equal right to contest for control of those assets. So this may sound like a paradox, probably does, to people in this room, everyone who grew up during or after the Cold War, because in the Cold War, it was supposed to be capitalism versus communism, right? And this seems like a contradiction. How can something be both the most extreme form of socialism and the most extreme version of a free market at the same time? That, however, was not just a possibility. It was a dogma for the people who invented modern economics, the political economists of the late 19th century, the people who created the marginal revolution that gave the name to the blog that some of you may know of, like Leon Walras and William Stanley Jevons, they believed that to have a truly free market, you had to have common ownership, that there was no way to have competition without common ownership. And that idea was most closely associated with this gentleman here. Um, can anyone who's not read the book, I guess this is a crypto world, everyone likes to hack things, so I can't ask you to be honest with me, but um, can, can anyone who's not read the book tell me who this person is? Who? I have, I have not read the book. No, can anyone who's not read the book tell me who this person is? So, so how many people recognize this guy on the right when I put him up? How many people recognize the guy on the left when I put him up? How many people recognize this guy? So this guy outsold the past two guys by a factor of three. He was the best-selling author in the English language other than the Bible for 30 years. He, was, uh, he had the same rev relationship to the Chinese revolution against the Qin dynasty that, um, that uh, Marx had to the Russian revolution against the Romanovs. And his ideas, because they incorporated these aspects of socialism and of free markets, have largely been lost to the world because of this capitalist communist debate. His name is Henry George, and luckily, while none of you know about him, his ideas were not entirely lost. They continued to develop within economics as the field called mechanism design, uh, for which William Vickery and several others won the Nobel Prize, and it was an attempt to take these ideas and make them into practical solutions for reshaping the world and for really solving the problems of inequality that we're facing today but they have mostly been used by Facebook and Google to price their ads. And what we do in this book instead is show how we can uh, use them to change the world using five uh, practical applications of these ideas. First is the common ownership self-assessed tax under which every owner of significant private property would self-assess the value of that asset, pay a tax on that self-assessed value. It would vary by asset, but about be 7% or so on, a, on average, and um, they would have to stand ready to sell the asset at the price they assessed. This would raise roughly two-thirds of the value of the capital stock um, and would thus suffice to give uh, every citizen, though this might not be the way it was actually used, it could be used for public goods, but if it was paid out as a social dividend, every family of four would receive roughly $24,000 a year, and at the same time you could eliminate all other taxes and grow the economy by our estimates by about 40%. Second, we propose a new system of voting called quadratic voting in which minorities are able to protect themselves rather than relying on bureaucrats, judges, and party leaders to protect them because they'd have a pool of vote tokens that they could allocate across different issues for and against different candidates, but extremists wouldn't be able to dominate because it would become increasingly costly to put more votes on something. So, uh, the cost would be proportional to the square of the number of votes that you bought. Third, we propose a new system of migration that we call the Visa Between Individuals Program that would rechannel the benefits of migration rather than accruing just to the migrants themselves and the wealthy people who employ them. 
Um, it would give every citizen of wealthy countries a stake in seeing more migration by allowing them to sponsor migrants, much as is done in Canada, and to negotiate for some uh, compensation for that. Um, in the process, it would build the support to have massively larger levels of migration than we currently have. Fourth, we argue that antitrust policy is absolutely critical to a free market economy. Just like you cannot have democracy in a one-party state, you cannot have free markets with monopoly dominating. But um, we argue that antitrust has not really been tried. What do we mean by that? Um, the biggest sources of market power, what we uh, believe accounts for about 90% of all market power in the economy, is completely ignored by an existing antitrust enforcement. Um, all of us who've ever worked a job know that employers have much more power over the people they employ than companies that sell things have over people who buy them from them. And yet, antitrust enforcement completely ignores uh, mergers or other uh, agglomerations of power that give people power over workers, what economists call monopsony. Second, um, antitrust completely ignores the fact that BlackRock, State Street, Vanguard, these few large asset owners own about 25% of the corporate economy and are four of the five largest investors in almost every uh, publicly traded company in the United States, creating the most iron monopoly we've ever seen, and yet there are simple things antitrust could do and it does nothing about these. Finally, we argue that um, the data that every day each of us contribute to Facebook, Google, other uh, AI and machine learning systems is what enables them to create the AIs that are supposed to displace our jobs in the future. Um, it's almost as if when movies came in, someone just went around videotaping people on the street and then saying that the video camera was going to displace stage actors. Uh, it's not the video camera that's displacing stage actors. Actors have a new way of reaching their audiences. But in that case, they would be treated like they had no value or like they were slaves. And that's what's happening to our data every day and we need to organize collectively in order to uh, change that, to create unions or other types of organizations that can bargain with these platforms for a fair share of the benefits they bring. So these are very radical ideas. They are uh, not things we would advocate adopting overnight. For all of the ideas, we have incremental near-term uh, ways of experimenting with them through entrepreneurship and so forth. But we put them forward as a general social vision or ideology because we think we desperately need that today. We think today our vision of the future of actually changing social institutions is dominated by reactionary populists like Stephen Bannon and um, Jeremy Corbyn uh, or by you know sort of vapid popular culture that doesn't offer a real response to this while power concentrates in the hands of a, a few technological platforms. But there is hope, we believe, in many areas. There are many people uh, from The Economist magazine, which put out a wonderful manifesto in this direction a few weeks ago, to Margaret de Vestager in, in uh, Europe, who's really trying to use antitrust policy to address these issues, uh, philosophers like Kwame Anthony Oppie and, of course, Vitalik, who are really trying to bring out a different path and organize people around it. And, uh, Partly as a result of this, this, we've got an incredible reaction to these ideas and we've been trying to catalyze all the work that started from the startups, that many of some of which you'll hear about this afternoon around these ideas, the artistic projects helping people to imagine this world in virtual worlds or in novels or in science fiction, the activists forming data labor unions uh, and other things, and incredibly creative academics who are trying to extend these ideas like Ananya Chakravarti who uh, is a post-colonial theorist and historian at Georgetown um, and who's actually leading some of the work we're doing about the ideas around these. So we've tried to catalyze all this work together into sort of a social movement called Radical Exchange that will be organizing sort of a DevCon style conference in March. Um, and there are so many opportunities, whether you're an artist, whether you're an activist, whether you're a, a, build, a technological builder, um, to get involved in this, and I hope some of you will be inspired by uh, this talk and our conversation this afternoon um, to contribute to what I think we all are really trying to achieve, which is not the, uh, some particular technology winning, but a sustainably decentralized world where by the very rules of the system, we try to break up uh,
dominations of power by small elites. Thank you. Thank you.